Well, the pastor just came back from Jerusalem, and uh, in his prayer, he quoted from the Hebrew Scriptures in English. I'll say the same prayer in Hebrew. Ken enenu el Adonai Eloheinu. Adonai Eloheinu ad sheyecheninu. Kiye avadim el yad el yad adonechem. Ken enenu el Adonai Eloheinu. As a servant looks to the hands of the masters, so we will look to the Lord and he will bless us, he will save us. He's absolutely right. Israel was a nation... God gave them the truth. But most of them have rejected their Messiah and forgotten their scriptures. The land is there, but you either have religious hypocrites who are so far from the truth of the scripture and secular Jews who are like secular people anywhere. They just don't care post-Judeo-Christian world. My family is a mixture of Jewish and Celtic Irish. And despite my New York accent, I assure you my grandmother spoke like you. She was from Glasgow. Family's from Donegal, but they came when they ran out of potatoes to Glasgow. And, uh, she'd, speak, she'd speak like you. When I was a little boy in New York, I'd ask her ridiculous questions, and she'd say things like, Adena Kinman, and things like that. <laughs> you know. But it's not only the Jews who forgot what God gave them. This area of Scotland, from where we are now, north up to the Grampians, this area of Scotland was baptized in the blood of the Covenanters. I guarantee you the average person in Scotland don't know who the Covenanters even were. Not far from here is Donald Trump's golf resort in Turnberry. Not many people know that his mother's great aunt was one of those women in the Hebrides praying for the revival when Duncan Campbell came. What good is a heritage if you don't live up to it? A heritage can mean everything or it can mean absolutely nothing. Jews had the heritage. Jews had the heritage. But for most, apart from the thankfully growing number of Jews who believe, it means nothing. And the religious Jews are even further away from the truth than the secular ones, blind to the meaning of the Torah, of their scriptures. Scotland is no different. They follow the same pattern. Israel and the Jews are simply a microcosm of the human condition. Quite a history here in Scotland. There was always wars, and the wars were always, you know, with the, it was obviously the clans, like the McDonald's and the Campbells and all that, and Glencoe, you had that. But there was a religious aspect to these wars. When Bonnie Prince Charles came, who was born in, in Rome, there was a fear of Roman Catholicism. And the reason the English were able to defeat him at Culloden was because so many lowlanders who were Presbyterian didn't want to <laughs> return to Roman Catholicism, so they fought against the Highlanders and against Bunny Prince Charles because they were fighting a surrogate of the papacy in their way of thinking. Down here, it wasn't like that. Here, the Covenanters could have saved their lives. I don't know if you've ever read it, but I mean, I, I remember as a young believer reading about some of the covenants as they took some parents and they said something to the effect, we have a surprise for you. Do you recognize this? And they lifted up a lid on a plate and it was the head and hands of their child. I mean, that was here. 
They faced unspeakable cruelty. And they could have easily, easily gotten out of it. Yes, it had a political dimension to it with England and Scotland and all that stuff, but this was not like resisting Rome or resisting the papacy. This was Protestant versus Protestant. They wouldn't acquiesce to the established church over certain issues. They said, no, we're not going to just take your version. We're going to take everything that's in the scripture. And they paid a terrible price for doing it. Yes, this land is baptized where you live, is baptized in the blood of the covenanters. Now again, I guarantee you the average person never would have heard of Alexander Peden or anything like that. The average person wouldn't know. Some would, but not many. Even many Christians wouldn't know. Turn with me, please, to the book of Acts chapter 20. Verse 20, Paul says, I did not shrink from declaring to you anything that was profitable, teaching you publicly house to house, solemnly testifying both to Jews and to Greeks of repentance towards God and faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. Whenever you see Jesus or the apostles or John the Baptist or the Hebrew prophets, there's always repentance. Repentance. It begins with repentance. I'll declare anything that's profitable. And he begins with repentance. When I became a believer in New York, I was living immorally and I was addicted to cocaine. And I was with my girlfriend, we were living immorally. And uh, one of the, the first thing that happens, you can't live with her anymore. If you're not married to her, you've got to stop taking. There had to be a repentance. Now, in my case, <laughs> I mean, I was addicted to cocaine as a kid. I, the Lord supernaturally delivered me from it and from a lot of other things. He's still working on me, but you should thank God you didn't know me then. And it was repentance. Today, and I'm only stating facts now, there are churches following a book from America called The Purpose Driven Life was better called the purpose driven lie, and I quote directly from that book. When you see a non believer living immorally and involved in substance abuse, don't tell them they need to repent. We have to be seeker sensitive. We have to be seeker friendly. Just tell them they need Jesus in their life, and then God will clean them up. He's confusing justification with sanctification. It's true that God cleans people up, but there must be a commitment. Just get Jesus in their life and he'll clean them up. If somebody doesn't repent, Jesus isn't coming into their life. Right away, the whole purpose of God, the whole counsel of God is not being declared in the contemporary gospel. We'll just leave that bit out. It's not politically correct. It's socially offensive. We have to be seeker-friendly. They're running on marketing psychology instead of on what the Word of God teaches. Well, let's go a little bit further. In verse 20, Therefore I testify to you this day that I am innocent of the blood of all men, I did not shrink from declaring to you, says it again, the whole purpose of God. Be on guard for yourselves and for all the flock among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers. To shepherd the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. I know that after my departure, savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. And from among your own selves, men will arise speaking perverse things to draw men, draw disciples after them. After the apostles go, people would come in. 
<coughs> to the church from the outside, and some would spring up from the inside. And unlike the apostles, they would not teach the whole purpose of God. When you leave something out, you have to fill it with something else. When you leave something out of the Word of God, you have to replace it with something else. False doctrine does not begin with false doctrine. It begins by not teaching all of the truth. The first and foremost defense against error is not apologetics. The first and foremost defense against error is a knowledge of the truth. If people were taught the whole truth, they would be much less prone to believe error to begin with. They'll draw disciples after them. And he says concerning this, I'm innocent of the blood of all men. He's drawing on Ezekiel 33, obviously. If you don't tell people what they need to hear, God's going to require their blood of your hand, said Ezekiel. Or God told Ezekiel. And Paul basically paraphrases Ezekiel from the Septuagint, from the Greek Old Testament. On a high street like this in a town in Scotland, and I thank you people for coming out on a rainy night on short notice, you're going to have a church like this one, and you're going to have a restaurant somewhere, in a local eating establishment a cafeteria. A cafeteria is a cafeteria and a church is a church. But not anymore. In Germany, they have a word play called Movenpick for cafeteria. It's named after a bird, but it resembles the English you move and you pick. You get a tray and you move along and I'll do the fish I'll do the salad, I'll do the soup, and you pick what you want. Okay. Today, in popular evangelicism in Great Britain, in Scotland certainly, we have churches that are cafeterias. They may have a cross on the roof. It may be a cafeteria with a cross on the roof, but it becomes pick and choose. It is not the whole purpose of God, not the whole counsel of God. We'll leave certain bits out. Well, let's look what the Lord Jesus said concerning this in the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 8. Verse 3, he humbled you and let you be hungry. He lets believers go through difficult times and fed you with manna, which you did not know, nor did your fathers know, that he might make you understand that man does not live by bread alone, but by everything, everything <coughs> that proceeds <coughs> out of the mouth of the Lord. Then he continues in this chapter in verse 18. But you shall remember the Lord your God, he'll show you how to make wealth to confirm the covenant and so forth. But he basically tells them, you've got to follow his program in the wilderness. He fed you this manna. Man shall live by everything. There's a relationship between the manna and the word. Let's look at Exodus chapter 16, please. Paul is drawing on themes from the Old Testament. Beginning in verse 14. When the layer of dew evaporated... Behold, on the surface of the wilderness there was a fine flake-like thing, fine as the frost on the ground. And when the sons of Israel saw it, they said to one another, What is it? For they did not know what it was. 
And Moses said to them, It is the bread which the Lord has given you to eat. This is what the Lord has commanded. Gather of it every man as much as he should eat, and you shall take an omer apiece according to the number of persons each of you has in his tent. The sons of Israel did so. Some gathered much, some little. And when they measured it with an omer, he who had gathered much had no excess, and he who had gathered little had no lack. Every man gathered as much as he should eat. Moses said to them, Let no man leave any of it until the morning. But they did not listen to Moses, and some left a portion of it till morning. It bred worms and became foul, and Moses was angry with them. Morning by morning it was there. Eat all of it, said Moses. Man shall live by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. A brief lesson in Hebrew. In modern Hebrew, if you want to say, what is it? You'd say, maze. Maze. What is it? In ancient Hebrew, you'd say, mana. 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 In other words, they're asking, what is it? What do you mean, what is it? It's what is it? <laughs> they called it, what is it? <laughs> they didn't know what it was. Now, the truths of the Old Testament are revealed in Christ in the New Testament. You can't understand the New Testament beyond a kindergarten level unless you understand how it fulfills the Old. And you cannot understand the Old beyond the superficial level unless you understand how it points to and is fulfilled in the New Testament in Jesus. What is it? They didn't know because the Messiah had not yet come and told them. But he's come and told us in John 6, what is it? Let's look at John chapter 6. Jesus tells them in verse 12, the same as Moses did, gather up the fragments that nothing will be lost. Eat all of it. Don't leave anything on the ground. It's not for the worms. Gather it all up. Jesus is the same thing as Moses. The Messiah would be a prophet like Moses. Then he'd go on. And he would say in verse 32, Truly, truly, I say to you, it's not Moses who's given you the bread out of heaven, but it's my Father who gives the true bread out of heaven. For the bread of God is that which comes down out of heaven and gives life to the world. I'm the bread of life. He who comes to me will not hunger. He who believes in me will never thirst. It's me. Mana, what is it? Old Testament, it's me. New Testament, says Jesus. It's revealed in the Messiah. Now he's the Logos, John tells us. And our guy who Logos, in the beginning, was it's the word of God. Man shall live by every word. Remember, the scripture is Jesus in print. Jesus is the scripture incarnate. If people who don't love the scripture, it means they don't love Jesus. But if they love Jesus, they're going to love his word. They will not base their beliefs on experience or cliches. They'll test every experience in light of what's written to see if it's from God or not. Well, let's go further with this now. Eat all of it, says Moses. Eat all of it, says Jesus. What is it? It's me. I'm the bread of life. Man shall live by every word. Let's see who does not teach the whole council. Let's see who likes to leave things out. Turn with me, please, to the Gospel of St. Matthew, chapter 4. The temptation narrative. 
This whole argument between Jesus and Satan was from the book of Deuteronomy. Satan would say, for it is written, and he'd be right. But Jesus would say, but it's also written. You just want certain bits. <laughs> you don't want the whole purpose of God. It's not text in context in light of co-text. It's I'll have this and I'll have that. It's a smorgasbord with you. It's a cafeteria. We'll do the salad today, please, not the soup. We'll do the fish today, please, not the veal. No sweets today, please. No, 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 no. God says eat all of it. Man shall live by every word. When you see people taking texts out of context and isolation from co-text and only teaching certain things in isolation from the whole context and whole text, that is the devil. They may not know it, that they're being manipulated by the devil, but they are being manipulated by the devil. I watched the clip about a, a preacher in the States and they were pressing him about homosexuality and he said, we have a stance on love. Everything else that we do depends on the individual situation. Wait a minute. Romans chapter 1 makes it clear homosexuality and lesbianism are wrong. Now, don't get me wrong. My cocaine addiction would have put me in the same hell as their perversion. But the same Jesus who delivered me from drugs can deliver them from the perversion. I know homosexuals and lesbians who've gotten saved. I know a number of them. Every word. We're just going to emphasize the love. No, no. Philippians 1.9 that your love, your agape, may abound in all knowledge and real discernment. If there is not a comprehensive knowledge of the doctrines of God's word, and this, not discernment, it is not the love of Jesus. It is a stupid, emotionally charged religious counterfeit. It is a stupid, emotionally charged religious counterfeit pretending to be the love of Jesus. But you cannot have the love of Jesus abounding without knowledge and discernment, Paul tells us. Jesus never once compromised truth or righteousness in the name of love. He told the Syrophoenician woman who was begging him to help her little daughter, and he said, I can't give the children's bread to dogs would almost sound like a racist statement. He dealt with the fact she was a pagan. Your gods, your religion is false. You're coming to me, the Messiah of the Jews? Oh, I can help you, but you're eating dog food. The Samaritan woman, you have this mountain, we have that mountain. Lady, you don't know what you're talking about. Salvation comes from the Jews. He corrects her wrong doctrine before he goes any further. The Lord Jesus never once compromised doctrine in the name of what some people ridiculously pretend to be love. The ecumenical movement is like that today. We have anyone here who was a former Roman Catholic? Okay. You've got an old... Irish lady laying on a deathbed with scapulas around her neck, repeating prayers to Mary, afraid of dying and going to purgatory. She can know that the blood of Christ cleanses from all sin. She can know there's an assurance of salvation based on his completed work and faith in what he did. But you're going to leave her to die in fear. And then you're going to call that love? That's not love. That's sick. Oh, you're unloving. You're judgmental. You're not loving our Catholic friends. If I didn't love them, I wouldn't care what they believed. Find me an ex-Catholic who wasn't glad somebody told them the truth. 
to set them free from that bondage. Not that mainstream Protestantism is any better, I assure you. But let's continue. Eat all of it, for it is written. For it is also written, man shall live by every word. When you see the pick and choose stuff, look out. Oh, they believe in Jesus and they, yeah. yeah, they also believe they have to atone for their own sin in purgatory. He paid for all their sin. Tell them the truth. Don't let that old lady die in fear. Oh, we have to love. You don't love her or you love till you tell her the truth. Don't call it love. Don't call it Christianity. Call it religious garbage because that's what it is. If you leave something out, you have to fill it with something else. And so we go. Let's talk a little bit about Scotland. I'm trying not to offend anybody, but no matter how much I try, I usually don't succeed. Perhaps it's my New York brashness, I don't know. Not far from here, not far from where you are seated at this very moment, less than one hour's drive from where we are right now, less than one hour from here, English Puritan Calvinists who got their theology from John Owen, the senior Puritan theologian and spiritual advisor and chaplain to Oliver Cromwell, the English Puritan Calvinists, and the Scottish Presbyterian Calvinists massacred each other in the name of Jesus Christ less than one hour from where we are seated. The English Puritan Calvinists and Scottish Presbyterian Calvinists massacred each other. Forget Glencoe and the Campbells and McDonald's. That, that was nothing. We're not talking about the people resisting money Prince Charles or the papacy or Culloden. We're talking about not just Protestant against Protestant. We're talking about Calvinist against Calvinist. They slaughtered each other. Now the blood of the covenant of the covenanters. That's something that any Scottish Christian can rightly be proud of. But the blood of the Calvinists killing each other in the name of Jesus Christ, that is a mark of shame on this nation and its church and its history. Where did Jesus ever teach that? But it happened. <clears throat> Now you've got to understand John Knox's Calvinism and John Calvin's Calvinism were not exactly the same. And the remonstrance of Dort Calvinism with the two lips, that, <laughs> when people say Calvinist, there's different schools of it. The basis of John Calvin's Calvinism was not the tulip, you know, the limited atonement, the total depravity, it was not that. To him, it was covenant theology, which basically spiritualized the church as Israel. And he said there's two covenants, not the old and the new, as the New Testament says, but God made one covenant <laughs> with Adam and one with Abraham. That's it. There's two covenants, one with Adam, one with Abraham. The New and Old Testament, as we think of it, is, is not the focus of... This is what he taught. 
This is what he actually, this was the basis of his theology. Well, then came the Dort and the rest of it and the tulip and so forth. But look with me, please, to 1 Timothy. Chapter 2, verse 3. This is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior. Now that's a Christological statement. It points to the deity of Jesus. Who desires all men to be saved and come to a knowledge of the truth. He desires all to be saved. 1 Timothy chapter 4. Verse 10, it is for this we labor and strive because we have fixed our hope on the living God who's the Savior of all men, especially of believers. Now it draws a distinction between believers and unbelievers. But he said, if I be lifted up, I'll draw all men to myself. He doesn't want anybody to go to hell. And so I present this to our Calvinistic brethren, and some of them are saved. This is good and acceptable in sight of God who desires all men. No, all men just means the elect. No, it doesn't. The Greek word electos doesn't even appear in the text. And elect in Greek doesn't mean what you're making it out to mean. Elect is not what you think it means in English. And it's certainly not even in this text in Greek. He's the savior of all. He died for everybody. The idea that a God of love and mercy created certain people to go to heaven and he created and predestined certain people to go to hell to torture them forever. This is not the God of Israel. Jesus said, hell is a place prepared for Satan and his angels. Hell was made for demons. It was made for devils. It wasn't made for people. Unfortunately, many people are going to go there, but it was not God's choice. It was made for Satan and his angels. There's nobody who the Lord is not willing and wanting to save. Now, in eternity, he's omniscient. He knows who will be saved and who won't, but he didn't create people to torture them. Our ministry, we take care of children in the third world, in Africa, Philippines, places like that. And uh, the birth rate in the third world is very high. Why will an impoverished woman have 10 children knowing that Half of them are going to be dead before the age of 15, and others, many of them are going to die in infant mortality. Why will she have 10 kids, knowing most of them are going to be dead before they grow up? Well, the answer is she'll have the 10 for the sake of the five who live. There's no pension or social security or anything like that in the third world. Your children are your pension. For the sake of the ones who live, I'm willing to see the others die. For the sake of the ones who will accept Jesus, who will repent and believe the gospel, he's willing to let the others perish. But not by his choice. He's the savior of all men, especially of believers. Well, then they say, this is what they say, if he's the savior of all men, that means everybody's going to be saved. You're a universalist. Notice what Calvinism does. It turns a theological issue into a philosophical issue. (laughs) It shifts from theology to philosophy. The foolish philosophies of the world. That's the first thing. Secondly, 
What they don't tell you is this. Their way of thinking that God predestined these people to go to hell, that is the teaching of Islam. Inja Allah. Anything that happens is God's perfect will. He made some for heaven. If somebody goes to hell, that's Allah's perfect will. When you understand it philosophically, extreme Calvinism, now I'm not talking about moderate Calvinists like Charles Spurgeon or somebody like that. I'm talking about the dogmatic ones that have had so much influence on Scottish history and church life. That brand of Calvinism, it has common ground. It's, it's not Judeo-Christian, it's Islamic. It is not scriptural, it is Quranic. It's the teaching of the Koran, not the scripture. Why did they have this holy war in Scotland between the English Puritans and the Scottish Presbyterians? Why did they have a Christian jihad, a Christian holy war? Why do they do what the Muslims do? Remember, most jihads that the Muslims have are, are fighting other Muslims. <laughs> they say it's against the infidel, but most jihads are Muslims killing each other. Sunnis killing Shias and so forth. Why do the Calvinists do the same thing as the Muslims? Why is their history the same as the Muslim history? The history was the same because they believed the same things. You understand? Islam pretends to be the same as Judeo-Christian belief and faith. It says the Quran is simply the Third Testament and Allah is the God of Israel. No, he's not. Is an Abataean moon god, and it's not a third testament. Either is Calvin's Institutes. They do the same thing. If you look at Calvin's police state in Geneva, he burned hundreds of people alive. He had a cult comp, a war on culture, all of this stuff. The same as what the Mutawa do in Saudi Arabia. I've been to Saudi Arabia, I've seen it. And the same as what happens in Iran with the mullahs, the, you know, mutants outlaw all kinds of culture and things. They did the same thing as the Muslims. Why? Because they had the same beliefs. And so in Scotland, where we sit, we have a noble heritage of the Covenanters, and we have a shameful heritage of Calvinism. Nobody can deny the historical reality of what I've just told you. These things really happened. You see, to save their necks, the Covenanters would have only had to say, okay, we'll only accept these doctrines that you want us to. We'll leave the other doctrines out. How can a British monarch be the head of the church if Christ is the head of the church? We'll just leave that out. Uh, no. Covenant has said, no, we're not leaving anything out. The whole purpose of God. And they were persecuted. All they had to do was eat in the cafeteria instead of the church. That's all. This goes on and on. When I was first saved in the 1970s, early 1970s, in the aftermath of the hippie movement, there was a revival among hippies in the United States. And coming from that background, I became a believer, and I never knew of any two born-again Christians who got divorced and remarried. I knew of people who were divorced and remarried before they were born again, 
or I knew of cases where somebody got born again and their unsaved husband or their unsaved wife left them and went off with somebody. <laughs> but the idea of two saved Christians getting divorced and remarried, I never knew anybody like that. I didn't know anybody who knew anybody like that. That was the world. Believers don't do that. I hate divorce, saith the Lord. Today there are churches professing to be evangelical, people claiming to be born again, that have people saying they're Christians in adulterous marriages with children who in the eyes of Christ are born out of wedlock. No biblical grounds for divorce and remarriage. It wasn't like the unbeliever left or something that happened before they were saved. I mean Christians who get divorced and remarried. In the United States, among these tele-evangelists, many of them, many of these money preachers are divorced and remarried. Read what Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount. They're living in adultery. And when they take the Lord's Supper, they eat and drink judgment unto themselves. You can't say that. We'll just leave it out. Jack and Phyllis are so happy together. Plus, they're good tithers. <laughs> yeah. We'll just leave that bit out. We'll only take the bits that are convenient. No. Man shall live by every word. I was speaking in Christchurch, New Zealand one time, well, many times, but one of the times I spoke in Christchurch, New Zealand. <coughs> it was before the earthquakes, but anyway, there were some people who came to me from a large charismatic church that was Anglican, a charismatic Anglican church, similar to Holy Trinity, Brompton, and London, that kind of a place. And they came to hear me speak, and they told their vicar that they were coming to hear me speak. And he knew who I was, and he said, oh no, we're not having that Israel and prophecy stuff in this church, it's too controversial. It's divisive. We don't want to hear it in this church, it's too divisive. And they came and told me what he said. Now, I didn't ask to be invited to that church, you understand? I had, not, I had no interest in even going there, particularly. But people from the church, some of them listened to my recordings and things like that, and they were coming to hear me speak, and this is what the vicar told them. So I said, well, let's see. And I said this publicly, and he, it was recorded and it was circulated. And I said to him, I said in a meeting, Jesus said, Jerusalem will be trampled down by the feet of the Gentiles until the time of the Gentiles is completed, Luke 21, 24. Weeping over Jerusalem in Matthew 23, 39 and 40, Jesus made it clear the Jews would have to be in Jerusalem again and say, Baruch haba b'shem Adonai, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord for him to return. <clears throat> Zechariah chapter 12, verses 1 to 10. Jesus speaking in the Old Testament through the Holy Spirit, the book of Zechariah. I, I, will pour out on the house of Judah and the house of Israel the spirit of grace and supplication. They'll look upon me, who they have crucified, pierced, and mourn as one mourns for an only son. They'll be in Jerusalem and see him return as the rejected Messiah. It's the only way 
major passages of the book of Revelation and the Old Testament make sense as if you take the words of Jesus literally. But that's controversial. You don't want that bit. You leave that bit out. It's controversial. But you're an Anglican. You're in a denomination that's ordaining homosexuals and lesbians and compromising on same-sex marriage. Your church is ordaining homosexuals and lesbians into the ministry. And you telling me that Israel's controversial? But you're in a church perpetrating those kinds of abominations in the name of Jesus? You stinking, hireling hypocrite. Why don't you go get an honest job? He took it personally. <laughs> when that earthquake came and knocked down the Anglican Cathedral, praise the Lord. <laughs> Nope, we'll have this, we won't have that. We live in an age where the feminism of the secular world is permeating the body of Christ. Can God use women? Absolutely. Can women be in leadership and teach the word of God? Yes, to other women. Wherever there's a Priscilla, there's an Aquila. Wherever there's an Esther, there's a Mordechai. Wherever there's a Deborah or a El, there's a Barak. God does not circumvent leadership being male. But while it's true to say wherever there's an Esther, there's a Mordechai, and wherever there's a Deborah, there's a Barak, and wherever there's a Priscilla, there's an Aquila, wherever there's a Jezebel, there's an Ahab. She's wearing the trousers. He's wearing the skirt, and it's not a kilt. This is getting into the church now. It's Jezebel's spirit. And if you look at these women, they're teaching fundamentally false doctrines. It so happens I can speak Hebrew and read Greek, it so happens. And I remember a, a pastor from Wales who lived in Australia showed me a video as it was then. It was videos, it was before CDs and things like this. Of Joyce Meyer, who was paid 12 million a year plus royalties for his stuff. And, and she said, this, I'm only quoting her now. I'm not throwing rock, I'm just telling you what she said. That it says in the original languages in the scripture, that's how she put it, that when you give something to the Lord, by implication, her ministry, God gives you a receipt. So that when you want something, you bring your receipt. And God is obligated to give it to you. First of all, the earth is the Lord's and all it contains. He's not obligated to give us anything. If we gave him every cent we've ever earned, every penny, we couldn't even begin to make a down payment for our salvation. You can't give him what's his anyway. Receipt. Well, the Hebrew word for receipt is kabbalah, from le kabel, to receive. It's where you get the term for mystical Judaism. It's certainly not that word. In Greek, there's two words for receipt, two. One is a rabbinon. A rabbinon we usually translate in English as pledge or earnest. The Holy Spirit is our rabbinon. It proves we are purchased by the blood of Jesus. It's like if you order a Christmas parcel online, okay, um, Christmas present or Hanukkah present or something like that. And a week before, you know, when you print off a receipt with your name and a number on it. And then FedEx or DHL or wherever it is, or the parcel post comes to your door and they ask to see your 
receipt, and you have a receipt with a matching number on the parcel, have a nice holiday, here's your present. Well, that receipt proves we have been purchased, you understand? It's the Holy Spirit, that's mine, I'll have it. So when Jesus comes back, he says, he's mine. She's mine, he's mine, he's mine, she's mine, I'm mine. Come back, it's mine. That's the Arabinon. The Holy Spirit is the receipt. It proves that we were bought and paid for by the blood of Jesus. Third word is to telestai, Greek word meaning paid in full. Only occurs one time in the New Testament. It's what we call hapex legemini, perhaps one place only. Well, it's certainly not an Arabanon. It's certainly not a Tetelestai, and it's certainly not a Kabbalah. I wonder where Joyce Meyer learned Greek or Hebrew. These people have phony doctorates and everything. It's ridiculous. But women watch her. She's their guru. Cindy Jacobs is another one. This is false prophetess. Unbelievable. Bet more. These are crazy women. This is the Jezebel spirit. Oh, but we live in the age of feminism and women's liberation. <laughs> yeah, look at the social phenomena of women reaching 30 who can't find husbands. <laughs> They hit the wall. Now feminism is turned against women demographically. Quite a thing. You can't say that. You can't speak out about women pastors. Leadership is male. When Adam and Eve sinned, Jesus came looking and said, Adam, Adam, where art thou? What's going on, Adam? The woman, the woman did it. She fell first. She did it first. I'm, I'm talking to you, Jack. <laughs> the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ is head of the church. And there's a reason. My wife is a mathematician. My daughter's a lawyer. I know women physicians, women engineers. They're as good as any man. But in relationships and in the church, leadership is male. Can God use such women? Absolutely. He can use an Esther. What is a Mordecai? He can use a Deborah where there's a Barak, and he can use a Priscilla where there's an Aquila. But he does not use a Jezebel. Somebody else uses Jezebel and her Ahab, not the Lord. We'll just leave that bit out. It's inconvenient. Let's look at Revelation chapter 14. Verse 11, And the smoke of their torment goes up forever and ever. And yao tau and yaune is in Greek, <coughs> translating the Hebrew oleme olamim. The late John Stott wrote a book saying we can't tell people there's eternal damnation, eternal hell. He's an annihilationist in his leaning. Wait a minute. It says that this, this term, Anyao Tao Anyaunes, that's used for the eternal high priesthood of Jesus, for the eternal glory of God, and for our salvation. If hell is not eternal and conscious, how can you prove heaven is? We'll just leave that out. John Stott didn't put that bit in his book. 
Well, let's look. They have no rest day and night, those who worship the beast in his image, and whoever receives the mark of his name. Well, let's look at Revelation 20. Verse 4. Then I saw thrones, and they who sat on them, and judgment was given to them. And I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded because of their testimony of Jesus and because of the word of God, and those who had not worshipped the beast or his image, and had not received the mark on their forehead and on their hand. And they came to life and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. It is clear that those who take the mark of the beast and worship the Antichrist and his image, effectively worshipping Satan, will not be in the resurrection of the righteous. The smoke of their torment goes up forever and ever. Oh no, it will be possible to take the mark of the beast, sell your soul to Satan, worship the Antichrist in his image, and still be born again and go to heaven. Even though the Holy Spirit will no longer be convicting men of sin and restraining evil, it'll be possible to be born again and saved and go to heaven even if you take the mark of the beast and worship the Antichrist. But what about Revelation 24? What about Revelation 14, 11? We'll just leave that bit out. Of whom am I speaking? Do not take my word for it. Go on YouTube and listen to him. Watch him for yourself. John MacArthur. What's going on here? Is it a church? Or is it a cafeteria? Jesus never said to make converts. He said make disciples. Converts fall away. Converts fall away. Parable of the sower and the seed, Matthew 13, converts don't last. Only disciples can stand. The first step of biblical discipleship, believer's baptism. I'll tell you what, you can walk out that door a thousand pounds richer. I will write you a check for one thousand pounds right now. No questions asked. If you can find believer's baptism for me in an alpha course. You won't find it. Oh, they can make converts! But not disciples. We'll just leave believer's baptism out of it. We'll just leave the blood of Christ cleanses from all sin instead of purgatory out of it. We'll just leave I hate divorce and whoever divorces his wife save for pornea, sexual immorality, we'll just leave that bit out of it. The prophetic purposes of God for Israel and the Jews, oh, we'll just leave that bit out of it. Repentance, oh, we'll just leave that bit out of it. Paul warned the time would come when people would come into a church from the outside and people would spring up from our own midst inside and not teach the whole purpose. They'd leave something out. And inevitably, it becomes replaced with something else. They leave the manna for the worms. We'll just eat this, leave the rest for the worms. Jesus said, gather up the fragments. Moses said, eat all of it. Man shall live by every word. No, leave that for the worms. Just eat this. In the USA, there's universities who are sometimes better known for their sports than they are for their academic achievements. 
some of them, not all of them. And they have a cafeteria and a refractory. The refractory are for people on sports scholarships. They have a prescribed diet put together by a professional sports nutritionist. This many isotonic beverages, this much carbs, this much protein. Everything is weighed out exactly. You will eat this. The other students go to the cafeteria and pick and choose, but the athletes have a prescribed diet. You will eat this. This much protein, this much carbs, this much isotonic beverage, this much, this much, it's all prescribed. In professional sports, diet is an important component of athletic training. Paul the Apostle takes the example of ancient Olympic athletes and applies it to us and to himself. I've run the good race. I fought the good fight. I buffet my body. God's team always wins. God's team is a team of winners, not losers. The reason they win is they do it, he tells them. Eat this. Eat this. Eat this. Man shall live by every word. Leave nothing for the worms. Leave nothing to melt into the ground. Eat all of it. It's Satan who left bits out. It's people animated, influenced by Satan, who leave bits out. But the Lord says, eat all of it. No, your forebearers, the covenanters, You may not think of yourselves as the descendants of the covenanters, but ecclesiologically and historically and even anthropologically, you are. They said, no, we're going to eat all of it. We're going to declare the whole purpose of God. Well, can't you just agree that Jesus is is, is the Savior? Oh, we agree with that. But we don't agree with the rest of this nonsense. It's not scriptural. They ate all of it. No. They didn't have buildings to meet in very often. They met out in fields and stuff like that in the mountains. I didn't. They might not have had the building, but they were the true church at that time. I'd rather have a picnic out in the field and eat the diet that God has prepared for us than eat in a cafeteria pretending to be a church. Is it a church or is it a cafeteria with a cross on the roof? Where do you eat? What do you eat? I can only answer that question for myself. I can't answer it for anyone else. I can only answer it for me. But I can ask it for all of us. Is your church a church or a cafeteria? Man shall live by every word. Hine, hine, avadim, eliad adonechem, etre shivcha, eliad virta. Ken enenu el, adonai eloheinu, adonai eloheinu, ad sheyechanenu. God bless and thank you for listening. Pastor.